All right, so our uh, next and last speaker for the morning session is Isabel Garcia Garcia from Santa Barbara. She's going to tell us about the, the rocket science of expanding bubbles. That's right. So hopefully the title of my talk, uh, the reason for the title of my talk will become clearer uh, later. Uh, let me start first with some of the motivation uh, for the topic of this talk. And we all here know that based on their phase transitions happening sometime in the early universe, are a very well motivated possibility, both in minimal extensions of the standard model, but also more generally in hidden sectors that may have their own grid dynamics. So current and future observatories uh, may be sensitive to the resulting stochastic background of gravitational waves that is produced during uh, one of these phase transitions. For example, as we've heard already uh, in this workshop, uh, a very exciting prospect is a very exciting prospect is the possibility of uh, Lisa probing uh, the frequency regime that is relevant to the electroweak scale and the, electroweak, the nature of the electroweak phase transition. Moreover, an observation of a stochastic background of gravitational waves that doesn't have an astrophysical origin would also be an ambiguous evidence that there are degrees of freedom beyond those that we have in the standard model. So, Typically, these stochastic uh, gravitational wave signals are characterized by, roughly speaking, you know, three different quantities, which are the frequency peak of the signal, uh, the strength of that peak, and also uh, the spectral shape of the signal. Okay, the spectral shape, in particular, uh, as well as the strength, uh, depends very strongly on what is the dominant source of gravitational radiation during the course of the phase transition which in turn also depends on uh, the bubble wall dynamics. So we've already heard in this uh, workshop uh, some examples of what can constitute the most important source of gravitational radiation during a phase transition. So for example, uh, in transitions where uh, most of the energy that is available in the transition actually goes into accelerating the bubble walls. These walls move with uh, Ever increasing velocities, uh, eventually, you know, very quickly asymptoting the speed of light. These type of bubbles uh, are typically referred to as runaway bubbles. Uh, their velocity just keeps increasing as they expand. Uh, in this case, the dominant source of gravitational radiation is that emitted in the collision between these bubble walls. Okay, and both analytical and numerical simulations show that. In the high energy uh, regime of the signal to the right of the peak of the stochastic background, the, the spectral shape of the background falls off as one over the frequency. In contrast, uh, bubble walls that reach a terminal velocity at some point during this expansion, some limiting gamma factor gamma star, this gamma factor may be large, but the walls only carry uh, an infinitesimal fraction of the total energy that is available. Instead, the dominant fraction of the latent heat moves into heating up the thermal plasma. And this means that basically motion in the thermal plasma, like sound waves or turbulence, that ends up constituting uh, the main source of gravitational radiation, okay? And in this case, also uh, a combination of numerics and analytics shows that the high frequency tail of this uh, stochastic background falls off actually mass faster, one over f to the fourth, okay? So it is clear that understanding the dynamics of bubble walls uh, in phase transitions, and in particular, whether they become, they reach this runaway regime or not, is actually very important to be able to have a handle in both the shape, but also the strength of uh, gravitation, the gravitational wave signal, okay? So this is going to be sort of like the motivation uh, for the rest of my talk. Let me remind you when, under what circumstances, can, can bubble walls reach a terminal speed. So basically, uh, whenever there is a source of friction on the expanding walls that is able to counteract the expanding pressure that arises from the difference in energy densities uh, between the inside and the outside of the wall, when these two terms are equal to each other, then the bubbles will just reach some terminal velocity and then continue expanding at that speed. Um, the most known source of friction are particles whose mass changes as they cross the interface from one vacuum into another vacuum. So um, at leading order, um, for example, you have particles uh, in a, if, if bubbles are expanding uh, in a thermal plasma, and there are particles in the plasma whose mass changes, then they will contribute to this pressure, uh, to this friction in this way. 
uh, pretty much independently of the type of particle up to or the one you know factors in front. And next to leading order in the couplings, uh, certain phase transitions where vector bosons gain a mass uh, in the across the interface and where there exist charged particles in the plasma, uh, charged on their, you know, that couple to the scale bosons, there can be uh, a different source of friction that goes by the name of transition radiation that has these, these other scaling. So notice in particular, it grows as the gamma factor of the expanding walls. Um, and this is actually the same physical effect as when a moving electron crosses um, the interface between two materials with a different refractive index. Radiation is emitted uh, in that in that process that goes by the name of transition radiation, and this is the same physical effect generalized to you know in this thermal context. So, for example, uh, and this was only by the way uh, realized relatively recently in 2017. And in fact, this is very relevant for uh, thermal phase transitions, like for example the electroweak phase transition. If this was first order, um, the fact that this friction grows like the gamma factor, comparing this to the latent heat for something like the standard model forces uh, a, terminal, a, a terminal gamma factor of order uh, between 10 and, and only 100, okay? Previous to this result, it was actually believed that the standard model itself would have uh, runaway bubble walls uh, and much higher relativistic velocity. So as you see, this is uh, very much sort of like recent work uh, and very important to determine, uh, you know, the asymptotics of the, of the bubble wall uh, dynamics. So for the rest of this talk, we are going to focus on the following uh, setup or, or scenario. So we're going to consider a planar wall that is going to stand for a sufficiently large uh, bubble wall with some velocity. And this bubble wall uh, is not expanding in a thermal plasma. It's going to be expanding mostly against a population of cold and otherwise uh, non-interacting massive vectors with some number density, okay? And the crucial assumption is that the mass of that vector uh, changes uh, its value uh, from one side of this interface to the other side. Uh, so I'm gonna take that as the sort of setup we're gonna focus on. I am, you can have in mind if you want, and I'll comment on uh, a little bit more at the end of the talk, you can have in mind this massive vector that is all this what I call a, a non-interacting as maybe dark photon dark matter that exists in the early universe that has been produced at early times, but whose mass changes as a result of the phase transition in the early universe, okay? Uh, some of you will be familiar with this. Uh, it is normally easier to look at these problems uh, in, the, in the rest frame of the bubble wall. Uh, so the wall is at rest. And in this frame, a wind of dark photons is actually hitting the wall uh, with the opposite speed, okay? And just for simplicity, I'm going to take this speed to be along the positive c-axis. So at the end of the talk, we're going to discuss a little bit what the origin of this uh, change in mass can be, uh, but for the next few slides, it's just going to be enough for me to tell you that asymptotically on one side of this wall, the mass of this photon is uh, little m squared. Asymptotically on the other side of the wall is going to have a different value that I'm going to call m prime squared, okay? Okay, so this is a time-dependent background. Uh, the energy of the incoming photons is actually conserved uh, in their interactions with the wall, but the momentum along the c-direction actually changes leading to an effective uh, momentum transfer to the, to the expanded bubbles. The pressure on the wall due to this dark photon wind can be written uh, in this form. So this factor here uh, is just basically the flux of uh, dark photons hitting the wall. And this is basically the momentum transfer from both reflections and transmissions of uh, these, these dark photons, okay? R and T are reflection and transmission coefficients for the three uh, physical polarizations of a massive vector, and uh, delta kr and delta kt are the change in momentum for both reflected and transmitted particles, okay? Very intuitive uh, expression. So, for example, if we were interested in seeing what happens at ultra relativistic speeds, so let's say, you know, the energy of those incoming photons is much bigger than any physical scale in this problem, uh, we know that in that case, you know, reflection really goes to zero, everything gets transmitted, the change in uh, momentum for the transmitted vectors can be asymptotic in this way. And then we find an expression for uh, the friction, the, this uh, friction pressure in this limit that is a constant. Uh, so it's proportional to the energy density of uh, these dark photons, a 
proportional also to the fractional change in their mass. Okay. So this is what it looks like for this uh, you know, cold dark photon population. If instead you have the thermal plasma, uh, this is not going to allow us to get the order one factors right, but in this case, you know that number density uh, will go like temperature cube and the energy of the incoming photons will be proportional to gamma t. Uh, so you recover this expression that uh, I showed you earlier uh, that was um, discussed in these papers by, by Paul de Kramer. So, so far, uh, this is all part of the standard knowledge uh, of how friction works out uh, when there are particles that change their mass. Now, the standard way to determine whether particles are run away or not is to then compare this asymptotic value of the pressure on, on bubble walls to the total energy density, the latent heat of the transition, uh, in particular, the difference uh, in, in energy densities between the two aqua. If delta B is much bigger than this friction pressure, the bubbles will be able to run away. If delta B is smaller than this pressure, then they will get a stack at some intermediate value of gamma. So this is how basically you know, the determination is done. However, this requires or a very, a very important assumption is made in making these estimates, which is that the pressure, this friction pressure, uh, is a quantity that increases monotonically with the speed of the bubble walls. Now, that sounds kind of reasonable, but uh, for the rest of this talk, I actually going to tell you that there can be, uh, especially in the case uh, where there are massive photons around, uh, whose mass depends on this phase dependent quantity, there are interesting dynamics that, in fact, can lead to these, uh, the behavior of this friction pressure being non-monotonic. Uh, and in fact, the pressure can reach uh, a maximum at some intermediate gamma factor and can make it much, much harder for, for this runaway condition to be satisfied, OK? So let me move on to that. Uh, let me just remind you about some very basic features of massive vectors. So, our problem uh, to live in order is going to be reduced to basically solving the equations of motion for massive vectors uh, where the mass is like varying, especially varying quantity, okay? So when the mass is constant, you all know that Einstein's equations look like this and there is a consistency condition uh, also that you can you know, find out from here by taking the, the new derivative that uh, the vector field itself is the vertical slice, okay? We can expand this guy in plane waves with uh, the characteristic uh, uh, relation uh, for massive particles. Uh, and then we can also expand these coefficients uh, in terms of the different, you know, whatever our choice of uh, polarization basis is, uh, including, you know, two transverse modes and one crucially uh, longitudinal mode for our massive guy. When the mass is uh, especially varying quantity, uh, turns out the equations of motion actually look the same, but this consistency condition now looks a little bit more complicated, okay? You cannot pull out the mass outside and claim the, the vector is a person slice. So it looks like this, uh, where I'm here uh, making the assumption relevant to our case, which is the mass only depends on the Z coordinate. It turns out that for transverse modes, uh, because there is no uh, vector component along the direction of motion, transverse modes uh, are still divergence less, but crucially, uh, the longitudinal mode has a different uh, consistency condition imposed on it. So this already tells you that uh, all the interesting dynamics uh, are, are actually going to come from the, the behavior of the longitudinal modes. The easiest way to see this is to actually uh, look at our equations of motion and rewrite them in a way that look like the Schrodinger equation. And then we can use our knowledge of 1D quantum mechanics scattering to see the difference uh, between the two cases. So for transverse mode, again, no divergence, uh, I can just pull out the time independence um, and write this uh, as a function of C. Um, and this just looks like trivially uh, a Schrodinger equation where like the energy is omega squared uh, and the potential is m squared. So it's sort of like a scattering, uh, 1D scattering in a step, it's sort of like a step potential as we make the thickness of the bubble wall, L, smaller and smaller, this looks more and more like step. But basically, as we know from quantum mechanics, uh, provided this energy uh, is much bigger than the size of the step, we know that the reflection coefficients uh, will, will go to zero uh, pretty, pretty fast. 
Now, for the longitudinal mode, uh, if you take your uh, initial equation of motion uh, and define the relevant scalar quantity that uh, describes corresponds to the longitudinal uh, this longitudinal mode, actually the equivalent one the Schrodinger equation looks like this. Okay, so you see that the effective potential on which this longitudinal mode is scattering is actually somewhat more complicated, but crucially, it not only depends on the mass, uh, right, but it also depends on how fast that mass is changing, okay, the derivatives of, of this quantity. Uh, and this is a picture of, uh, you know, for some values of L and M of what that effective potential looks like. So by comparison, uh, the value of M squared, which is the potential of the transverse mode, is just this dotted line here. Uh, whereas these two features uh, actually are coming from dominantly uh, the simple derivative, okay? And the size of these guys is getting larger and larger as uh, the thickness of this wall becomes more tiny. So there is another uh, very important relevant scale uh, when it comes to uh, determining reflection and transmissions for mass spectres, which is the length, the thickness of the bubble wall, okay? And in fact, there is a regime uh, when you know, gamma factors go between one and one over ML. So basically values of omega between M and one over L, okay, the length, the energy scale determined by this thickness, where in fact the reflection coefficient for the longitudinal mode asymptotes to a constant, okay? It doesn't die with gamma, it doesn't die with energy, it asymptotes to a constant that is given by, by this expression, okay? By, by comparison, uh, the transverse modes are actually dying off like one over gamma to the fourth. For lack of a better name, uh, because this is a relativistic regime, but it's not quite the ultra relativistic regime where like, you know, omega is the largest scale. I'm gonna call this inter-relativistic for the, you know, reminder of this talk. Uh, if you really hate it, then maybe we'll send it in the paper, but for now it's inter-relativistic. Notice that the existence of this regime requires that this quantity n times L is tiny. Okay, so this intermediate regime is not necessarily going to be accessible in all phase transitions. It will be accessible in those transitions where you know the thickness of the walls is really small, so that this is this quantity is a large number. Okay, so and we'll see later on the talk. I'll say later on the talk cases in which you might expect this to be to be the case. Yeah, so this is a numerical analysis for some uh, choice of parameters. Uh, so this is a ten percent change in the in the mass vector mass uh, m times l uh, ten to the minus three. So the solid curves are uh, numerical solutions for the reflection and uh, transmission coefficients uh, where the mass changes uh, as a smooth function in particular tanch, whereas uh, the dashed lines are uh, analytic solutions obtained assuming that the mass changes as a step function. And as you would expect, you know, in this regime, which is this interrelativistic regime, that both of them agree pretty well, and you can see this plateau uh, in the reflection coefficient. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, in the last five minutes, so I said earlier, the pressure on the bubble walls is given by an expression like this. I can massage this expression a little bit uh, to make it more useful to us. So just using the fact that reflection and transmission probabilities sum up to one and focusing on the relativity theorem, we can actually write it in this way, okay? So I have this middle term here, uh, which is just a constant. Uh, which, if you remember, this is the term that survives in the limit gamma with infinity, so as a floating point. And then I have these two other terms that are capturing basically uh, the effect of uh, reflected longitudinal and transverse modes. Um, and as we said, in this interrelativistic regime, you know, this uh, RL stays constant, the reflection for transverse modes dies off very quickly, uh, making this term kind of uh, completely irrelevant. So I'm just going to forget about this term uh, for now. Uh, so again, in our regime of interest, uh, we know that RL is constant, so we have mostly these two terms. Notice this first term uh, is growing like gamma squared, okay? This is a result of the fact that, that again, reflection coefficient stays constant, the flux of particles grows like gamma, but also the change in momentum due to reflected particles grows like gamma, okay? So as you see here, uh, the overall pressure on these expanding bubbles is growing with gamma square, and it will keep growing until the end of this regime, which is rich for gamma, gamma factors of order one over ml, okay? 
Uh, the maximum value of the pressure, which is what I'm going to call maximum dynamic pressure, uh, putting back you know, this uh, expression for gamma and also the expression for the reflection coefficient looks like this. Uh, if ML is sufficiently small, uh, this will be dominated by this term. And the fun sign is that this can actually be much, much bigger than the naive uh, asymptotic value of that pressure, OK? Uh, it's better to show this with a plot. Uh, so this is what the, the friction pressure would look like for different, different values of the fractional change in the vector mass. And again, for you know, n times L being something around 10 to the minus 3. So as you see, this can lead to a situation where like intermediate friction can be actually a lot bigger than uh, these asymptotic values. So you, it's hard to see here, but like all of these lines asymptote to 1, since what we're plotting here is overall pressure over the, over the asymptotic value as a, as a function of gamma. Now, for uh, uh, rocket science aficionados, this plot may look familiar uh, because this is analogous to what happens when uh, you, know, you launch a rocket into space. Uh, there is a point uh, shortly, a couple of minutes or two after you launch the rocket, where the rocket actually experiences what is called uh, maximum dynamic pressure, maximum stress, which you know, in this field goes by the name of max Q, uh, and Q being the letter that people typically use for pressure in uh, the fluid dynamics literature. So you know, in, the, in the following, I'm just going to refer to the, the condition that uh, bubbles need to satisfy to actually be able to reach the runaway regime as the max Q condition, OK? So in general, there is a much stronger condition for bubbles to run away. Uh, the runaway criterion is not just that delta V uh, has to be bigger than the asymptotic pressure. It really has to be bigger than whatever maximum dynamic pressure uh, you know, these, these objects feel during their, during their evolution. Um, since you know, I'm sort of running out of time a little bit, uh, I think I only have three more slides. So uh, if this max Q condition is not satisfied, uh, if the difference in energy density is not large enough. As I said earlier, the walls will get stack uh, at some you know, equilibrium speed, uh, which is, is given by an expression like this, OK? Parametrically, so it's proportional to the difference in energy densities uh, divided by how much uh, you know, energy density in that photons there is outside, and then inversely proportional to the, the change in mass of the, of the dark photon. OK, so as you take, for example, the m to 0, then obviously there is no pressure on the bubble walls. They can run away, etc. Uh, so we can put in some numbers. Uh, here I am uh, normalizing the dark photon energy density to the dark matter energy density. So this would be relevant like if the dark photon just made all the dark matter. I'm also defining, uh, because it makes it a little easier, I think, to kind of get a grasp on what this means. So I'm sort of defining a parameter alpha as delta V over uh, T to the fourth. So thinking. So defining this temperature as the temperature of the standard model plasma at the time this transition is taking place. Um, and so alpha 0.1, for example, okay, it's a typical value that is floating around uh, when talking about potentially observable uh, uh, signals from, from phase transitions. So you know, this is something like for these values, uh, gamma star can be approached into a six. And this is many orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the types of gamma factors uh, these you know, that one could achieve uh, in, a, in a first order phase transition at this temperature and, and with this strength, okay? So this can really be a very important effect on how this affecting the evolution of these, of these objects. Um, another quick thing that I wanted to mention is that as a consequence of this, uh, there is a fraction of the dark photons uh, that as they get reflected uh, of these bubble walls, they are becoming relativistic, okay? potentially turning a fraction of the dark matter if you want into dark radiation. Um, it's hard to say, like, it's hard to compute exactly what that fraction is, but you can obtain an upper bound by assuming that, you know, the, the walls reach a terminal velocity pretty much during their entire or early on in their evolution, and then they continue moving at that speed. Uh, to count those dark radiation, of course, uh, they need to be uh, remain relativistic down to roughly, you know, BBN temperatures, uh, which is fairly easy for, you know, some reasonable parameters. Uh, however, if you, you know, you want to compute uh, their contribution to the to delta N effective, uh, 
that actually tends to be uh, a rather small number. So for, again, for these values of parameters, the base transition, you know, at 100 GB, where the dark photons make all of the dark matter, uh, you know, this is 10 to minus six, which is obviously unobservable. Uh, there's no reason why, you know, at these very high temperatures, uh, why the dark matter perhaps would then make uh, a larger fraction, uh, sorry, the, the dark photons perhaps would make a larger fraction of the dark matter, uh, maybe decay later. But basically for reasonable values, uh, that kind of effect is actually just very tiny. Uh, my very last slide uh, before the conclusion. So here I've been discussing uh, somewhat agnostically uh, about the possibility of a vector that changes mass across the phase transition. How could this arise in a more kind of you know, complete picture? Uh, so a first step towards that uh, is, so we can write down, uh, an effective theory first uh, with you know, our massive vector. So m squared here is constant for now. And then say we have some real scalar field and there is some potential that may include thermal corrections or maybe at zero temperature, whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but it's basically a potential that makes this real scalar field undergo a phase transition in the early universe. And if our vector uh, talks to this scalar field, uh, then once this you know, scalar field acquires a non-trivial profile, the vector, the vector mass will effectively change, okay, inside and outside uh, as it process this interface. Uh, even though this is a dimension for operator, uh, this is actually not a UV complete theory. Uh, this is an effective theory that requires UV completion at some scale that is basically set by uh, this combination of parameters. It's probably more illuminating for us to write it in this way. So basically, uh, 4 pi v, where v is the map of this uh, of this scalar field. And then times this factor that is again inversely proportional to the mass of the of the vector. Uh, if you want, you know, if you want the separation of scales between this effective theory and the UV cutoff, then this will be set in an upper bound on how how much this mass can change. And, and for instance, you know, as we're familiar with in an abelian Higgs model, this cutoff would be signaling uh, the appearance of the of the radial bulk, uh that you know is responsible for giving this vector a mass. And indeed, you know, you can write down a full UV theory where our vector is charged under some complex scalar field, and, and there's a coupling between this complex scalar field and our real scalar field that actually undergoes a transition later on of this form. When you integrate out this uh, complex field, let's say you know it's much heavier, then this will generate uh, this dimension for operator with a value of that coupling given by by these various combinations of, of the couplings, okay, of this theory. And I mean, this gives you, you know, you can compute what the, what the correction to the mass of this, of this vector would be. And notice, by the way, something that I want to emphasize is that this is an operator that is dimension four and it's not forbidden by any symmetries, okay? So it's actually maybe more of a thing to emphasize for, you know, dark photon, dark matter aficionados, which is that, very often we talk about you know split over masses blah, blah blah but in reality you know there's going to be a dynamical mechanism uh, for the mass of the vector uh, and the consequences of uh, of that mechanism can be can be interesting uh, important this is one such uh, so anyway this is just to mention uh, so just to sort of motivate how you know scenarios like what I've discussed here can arise in kind of very realistic situations and you know in particular. Uh, the case where this dark photon can be dark matter, I think makes it sort of interesting to, to consider uh, the implications of this. So let me just uh, conclude with this. So obviously, phase transitions are a, a very promising target for future gravitational wave observatories. It is going to be obviously very difficult, if not impossible, to discriminate uh, between different models, but there may be some general features uh, that you know about the dynamics that is that are responsible for, for generating those phase transitions that may be accessible uh, to us from perhaps uh, those observations. So it is important in order to uh, understand uh, you know what different shapes of the stochastic background mean. Uh, it's important to understand the qualitative dynamics that are possible for expanding bubbles uh, in the early universe. And I think it is interesting that actually much of the relevant work, uh, not only the work of Bode Kramur that I mentioned, but also other work uh, by other authors more recently in the last couple of years, including some people in the audience. Um, so that work is fairly recent, and there's surely much more to understand uh, in, this, in this area. 
As far as we know, this maximum dynamic pressure effect on bubble walls uh, is a new physical effect, uh, but there may be other sources of uh, maximum dynamic pressure beyond what I discussed here. So that would also be interesting to, to find out. So thank you.